how do you handle models being wrong but being useful? And that's another component of uncertainty that may be the hardest part to quantify. That's kind of the way most models work in economics. And, that, and so the hardest part of this whole exercise is the one that in many respects might be the most important. Every year, Nobel laureates and young scientists from all over the world come together at Lindau to educate, inspire, and connect. We're at the Lindau Nobel meetings for economics, and today we're talking with Lars Hansen. We're gonna talk a little bit about graduate education, then move on to some questions about econometrics. So, thank you for being here. My pleasure. I believe this is your first time to Lindau. What's been your favorite part about the meetings so far? It's certainly been fun to talk to some of the laureates one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, I would have to say getting to know some of the students, hearing about their research interests, hearing about their enthusiasm for economics in general is probably has, has been the high point of it. Really reminds me of my days in, in grad school. Yeah. Um, so you're giving lots of advice. What, what's the best piece of advice you got in grad school that, that really helped you be successful, that you would, you would pass along? For me, it was don't be afraid to ask questions. It was more of a general reminder that you know even when you're done formally taking classes, you've got to just keep on learning stuff. And it's yeah. really important to keep on learning and uh, pushing yourself. So I find myself often when I'm doing research projects, a big chunk of the research project is learning new stuff. So yes. the two things go hand in hand. No one's going to make you learn it in grad school. You got to you got to do it yourself. Well, you can't learn everything in graduate school. So you know, <laughs> as, as your as, as your research interests evolve, there's new stuff to learn. I, like when I, I was in graduate school, I knew very little about finance. Just didn't have any classes on finance at, at all. So that was all stuff that I, that that I taught with myself or with various co-authors and collaborations at Carnegie Mellon. So it turned out to be important for me subsequently. I guess <laughs> yeah. worked out okay. Yeah, it worked out okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, but but yeah. So let's move on to econometrics. Maybe you could just briefly tell us the difference between econometrics and statistics. I like to think about econometrics as where you really bring in and figure out how to use economics to guide your use of statistical tools. And so for me, it's the connection of the two that is really the most interesting part of it. A statistician is going to go out and try to figure out, well, what's the data generating process or what, you know, you know, how can I characterize that in a way that's revealing? And an economist wants to be able to use the model to ask counterfactuals, to kind of use it for other purposes. And that requires some thought to go into it and this can take the form of specific modeling inputs and the like and often frame the statistical investigation in a different way and in a way that can be revealing and productive. So I'm sometimes concerned that econometrics as a field is getting more and more specialized because it's going to look more and more like mathematical statistics and I think it's really important that it not lose its formal connections to economics. To models, yes, that's... So Bayesian econometric techniques seem to be taking over the profession and the world. What's the basic difference between a frequentist approach and a Bayesian approach, for the, again, for the people who may not be very familiar with this? Sure. So the Bayesian approach is you really want to you want to look across models, and you're willing to form probabilities across models. So the so-called priors uh, distributions, which you're willing to say, maybe I got five models on the table. Going into the analysis, I'm willing to put some type of prior probabilities over those models. As the data comes in, I'll update those probabilities and the like. When I write down a probability model, it tells me the probabilities of everything, but that model depends on unknown parameters. So there might be five different models, and so then the question is, how do I go across models? And so we're Frequentist premises his calculations typically conditioned on a model, but then it's kind of an incomplete form of inference because then how do you go across models in different ways? And so a frequentist can say, well, if we're this model, here's what would happen. If we're this model, here's how the statistics would behave and the like. Um, a Bayesian wants to go further than that and, and actually look across models, put probabilities across models, and then have full probability specifications. I know how to do hypothesis testing and a frequentist approach. For those who aren't familiar, can you do the equivalent to reject one model in favor of another in, in the Bayesian framework? So a Bayesian can certainly do things like say, well, if, if you're willing to put prior probabilities on across the different models at ex ante, you've got new data, you can now update that and put posterior probabilities over them. And so the data might lead you to think one model is more likely than another one. So you can do calculations like that. I, I often say that classical inferences is challenging because once you try to teach in a classroom what a classical confidence interval, you know, most of the time you get it wrong what's random and what's not random. And, and like, so for a Bayesian, it's the, you're putting a, prob a posterior probability over the different you know, forms of the parameters and it's a little bit easier statement to make. Because the classical calculation is a little bit of an in incomplete notion of inference. People often get confused what's random and what's not in that calculation. But a Bayesian's willing to think about the parameters themselves as being random. So it, 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 it maybe makes the language a little bit nicer. 
But you know, this comes with a cost. You know, it requires more inputs go into it, and I guess that's where it gets interesting and controversial. It's probably hard for an undergraduate who wants to go to grad school these days to get good tr training in Bayesian techniques. What what should a student do who wants to go to grad school to get ready for the, the, the new statistics that we're using? A lot of statistics programs these days do have very strong Bayesian components to them. I mean, it depends on the undergraduate education you're getting, I know. Certainly at the University of Chicago, I know for that, that, that they're exposed to a lot of Bayesian thinking in their, in their um, undergraduate classes. Sometimes I think in not enough critical ways. I guess myself, I view myself as a little bit in between. I consider myself closer to a so-called robust Bayesian. Um, I often have hard times forming a prior, and so I like to do prior sensitivity analysis at the very least, and then I want to ask, well, what are the consequences of me choosing this model over that model? So I want to kind of do that calculation too. So I think it's useful to put priors over models, but it may be useful to explore what happens as you change those priors and do sensitivity analyses and the like. And that's sort of your message of your book with Sargent on robustness? Or? That's partly. The, the, there's, there's another piece to this, and both Chris and I talk, dis, uh, touched on this yesterday in the panel discussion. At the end of the day, the models we, we look at, study, um, we often pick them out to be simple, uh, transparent, and communicable. And they're also kind of wrong. And so how do you handle models being wrong but being useful? And that's another component of uncertainty that may be the hardest part to quantify. It's like, here's this model. Um, I do all these like, fancy statistical calculations with it. I kind of know it's wrong, but I want to use it anyway. That's harder to connect it to a statistical inference. but. That's kind of the way most models work in economics. And, that, and so the hardest part of this whole exercise is the one that in many respects might be the most important. Let me switch gears just a little bit and talk about the financial crisis. Yeah. We didn't have good indications before the crisis of the pressures that were building up and the yeah. risk that was building up. What can we do better in terms of developing measures that will yeah. tell us about bubbles and problems developing? Is it network techniques and big data, or what, what exactly would, would you recommend? So at this point in time, it's kind of an open question. What's the, the right way to be connecting financial markets to uh, and integrate them into macroeconomic questions? I would say certainly kind of pre-financial crisis, a lot of the macro models had the financial sector was kind of a fairly passive uh, part of their model, and, and that led to models that weren't a very useful guide going in, into the financial crisis. And so there's lots of rethinking about ways to make the financing interactions with the uh, investment decisions and the like much more front and central and not just some passive thing in the background. The best way to do that, uh, there's lots of theoretical models out there with different configurations. Sorting out that empirically, I think, is a really wide open and very, very important question. Certainly, network approaches are one that has some, some appeal. They've been very useful to date as ways to describe financial networks. You know, like uh, Robert Merton today had these wonderful pictures of financial network and connections. But the thing we're, we're not yet good at is having good models of how the connections form endogenously and, and, and how they evolve dynamically. They've been very good descriptors. Going forward, it'll be nice to see if we can build richer models in which we can actually put, build more economics into them to, to, to make them a more usable policy tool. So that's possible one way to go. The other type of models people have been looking at is putting more explicit considerations into investment decisions and the like, and, and, and sometimes allowing these financial constraints to bind versus not bind and the like, and, and seeing what the consequences of that are. Now, these are different productive things to be doing, different interesting ways to be changing our models. And so what's going to be the right policy tool, or which of these tools is going to be the best one five and 10 years down the road? I'm not sure, but I think it's wise to invest in all of them and, and see. You can hardly open the newspaper these days without seeing the word big data. Yeah. And that was a big topic yesterday during, yes. during your talk. Absolutely. All of the talks are available, by the way, at the, at the website for the conference. And yeah. you, can, you can look at them. Um, so what are the advantages of big data and what are the risks? Or what is big yeah, data? Yeah, yeah, big data. <laughs> so there's kind of naive views of big data that I think we, you, had, you want to be cautioning against. One is there may be a hope that by going to big data, that the mo that the economic model will just jump out from the data. You know, we've got all this data. Shouldn't it just, you know, shouldn't I just like look at the data and the model will just jump out? And I think that is probably not going to happen. We still have to be thinking about what the potential mechanisms are. So we still have to bring economics to bear to ask the relevant questions of the big data and to guide the and to guide how we use the big data. It really has to be merged with a more serious scientific endeavor. I, I think it can't just be a pure statistical analysis of these really huge large scale data sets. Just because we have a lot of data, it doesn't mean that that data covers all the variation that we really care about. And so we still need to think about kind of what's the variation that's really relevant and most important for our policy questions and how much of that's really captured by the data or how much we really have to use a, an economic model to help us think our way through those, uh, uh, the sources of variation. So there's no guarantees the variation in, in even large-scale data sets are going to be the variation that will help us analyze what the next financial crisis is going to be.
and the precision yeah. matters too. More data is preferred to less. It's exciting to have these new data sets available, but I think we will have, still have to use them and very, you know, bring to bear economics to really get sensible interpretations from them. The guy who taught me econometrics says they're relearning all the lessons econ econometricians learned 10, 20 years ago. Uh -huh. For grad students interested in, in, in econometrics, what are some of the open questions? Where should they devote their effort? Where do you see it going? You know, we're talking about the success of the Bayesian paradigm, and, that, and I think that's a, across statistics, not just econometrics. A lot of that has been computational in nature. The Bayesian approach has been much more conducive to use of computational algorithms to help solve things, and so, that, so there's almost been a practical advantage to it. And this interacts with large data. If we're going to hit large data, you know, high dimensionals, now we have to put priors over very high dimensional spaces. And it's kind of known that those priors are going to have to be really informative some places, and often people pick priors not because of detailed prior thinking, but out of convenience, because you know these are the ones that are computationally tractable. And kind of how to do prior sensitivity analysis, how to really understand what those priors are imposing is sometimes tricky, and I think lots of creative thought has to be done on how to do prior sensitivity analysis, how to really understand exactly what prior information's being imposed in these uh, large dimensional systems, I think is uh, an important thing to add on to what's the computational advantages which we've seen so far. And the other thing is, how do we really think about merging economics into it? And, and, and do we build new structural models that are better adapted to the questions that can be asked with, the, with these new data sets? Uh, and, and if so, what might those models look like? You know, like, like you mentioned, network models. So like very rich data on, on, on financial systems open the door to maybe we can think more about network models of financial systems. And, and, and so that could be very useful. Uh, it could be an exciting area, especially if we can also integrate economics at the same time. Well, thank you. This has sure. been fun. Thanks. Okay.